Today's webinar is entitled Discovering Grammar with Consciousness Raising Tasks. During consciousness raising tasks, students are encouraged to notice characteristics and patterns related to form, meaning, and or use while actively exploring the target grammar feature. In today's webinar, we will examine this inductive approach to grammar teaching through several activities that address a variety of grammar topics and student proficiency levels. Our presenter today is Heather Benucci. You may recognize her as moderator Heather. Heather is a TESOL consultant with expertise in technology-supported language learning, materials development, and teacher education. She has worked face-to-face -face with English teachers and students in Korea, England, and the U.S., and is proud to have led virtual professional development programs for EFL teachers from over 100 countries. Heather knows EFL classrooms are different all around the world. She enjoys working with teachers to help them discover, adapt, and use engaging resources that will work well in their local context. And now I'll turn it over to Heather. Thank you for that lovely introduction, Curtis. Um, I'd like to say a big welcome to my colleagues and friends all around the world. Thank you for joining me today to talk about grammar and to explore consciousness raising tasks. Thank you also for your responses to the poll before the webinar began. Very helpful for me. We're going to talk a lot about those terms during this webinar. And before we get started, I, I do want to say that consciousness raising tasks are not a new thing. Uh, some of you might already be doing them in your classroom, and if so, that's great. Uh, for those that uh, haven't yet experienced them, we will explore them, and hopefully we will formalize the way you think about this type of activity. But before we get started, I want to learn some more about you and your opinions and feelings about grammar teaching and planning grammar instruction. So if we can move to the polls, please. Here are two questions for you all. The first asks you on the left, if you ever find grammar instruction difficult, the planning process, please share your answer there. And over on the right, I'm asking you to share some things that might make planning uh, grammar instruction challenging or difficult. Everyone faces a challenge with grammar here and again. Some options there are students think grammar is boring. I, the teacher, think grammar is boring. I'm not always confident in my own grammar knowledge. I know I have to go look up, I have to look up things every so often myself. Um, some people might find that their institution dictates how grammar is taught. Some people might not be sure about addressing learning styles or making grammar instruction communicative, picking a technique or a method. And uh, some people find grammar stressful because it is a very high stakes topic due to either district or national testing requirements related to language. Or maybe none of these. Maybe uh, planning grammar instruction is always easy for you. So let's check your responses here. It looks like most of us admit to finding some challenge with grammar instruction over on the left. And on the right, the overwhelming answer is students think grammar is boring. Hmm. I think that uh, is quite a common attitude. Let's go back to the presentation, please. Well, thank you for sharing your thoughts. And I will say, even though I am a very big grammar geek, I love grammar, still sometimes I feel like the poor woman in this picture. Um, it can be overwhelming as you try to be a, a strong, creative teacher uh, when presenting grammar. So on the bottom left, uh, we might see that your school or institution sort of tells you how you need to teach grammar, and, and you might struggle with that. You might be trying to figure out inductive versus deductive, what works with my learners. Um, sometimes students really focus in on the rules. Is that the right way to go as a teacher? 
Again, we don't want it to be boring. We want it to be student-centered. And there's all of these sort of methods and approaches out there. What do we pick? Can be very confusing. So let's see what we can do about that. Our mission today, unfortunately, I will say that we're not going to be able to answer all of the questions on the last slide for every single teaching situation out there. But I think we will examine some topics that will help us along the way to answering many of those questions. How are we going to do that? We will do this by uh, reviewing and exploring some concepts, some foundational terms related to grammar teaching and second language acquisition. You might hear me call it SLA. That's the study of how languages are learned. Then we're going to take an in-depth look at consciousness raising tasks. We'll learn what they are, why you might want to use them, and how you can bring them as a tool into your classroom. So, Bottom line, at the end of the day, I hope you are informed about consciousness raising tasks and feel confident about giving them a try in your own classroom. All right, so taking a few steps back in history, some of you might be surprised to know that in our field of language teaching, it's actually been a big debate. Should we teach grammar? Yes or no? As I said there, to teach or not to teach, that has been the question. For hundreds of years, the primary way of teaching grammar has been the grammar translation method. Have any of you heard of that? Raise your hand if you have. This approach really focuses on using rules and direct translation. Yes, I see many of you have heard about this method. Um, focuses on the rules to be able to do almost direct translation from one language to another. Very little emphasis on communicatively using the language, but as, approach, um, as an approach, uh, grammar was very, very important. Yes, we do teach grammar. Jumping up to the 20th century, uh, starting from around the 1950s, there was a series of language teaching methods, methods with a capital M, specific techniques. And these, if you want to learn more, I would suggest going to the American English uh, YouTube site. There's a video series called Language Teaching Methods, and they show things like The Silent Way, Suggestopedia, things you might have heard about before. We're not going to cover all of those, um, but if you want to learn more, they're there on YouTube. We're going to jump ahead instead to the 1980s, when Stephen Krashen came up with a sort of revolutionary approach uh, and said, no, no, we, as teachers, we don't need to teach grammar explicitly, directly. Uh, students only need lots of comprehensible input. And what does that mean? They need to be exposed to lots of language, and they, in their own time, will acquire the language almost naturalistically. So a big shift, and a lot of uh, institutions began to follow Krashen's teaching. And we had another shift that took place in the late 80s, early 90s, that really began to focus on communicative approaches that did involve grammar teaching. So looking back at our question, yes, we should teach grammar. Some of these approaches include PPP. Can someone in the chat, pot, chat box remind us uh, what PPP stands for? Anyone? I'll give you a hint. There we go. Thank you, Teresa in Peru. Presentation, practice, and production. Um, by the nature of the very first P, presentation, the idea is that um, grammar would, in fact, be presented um, in many ways, but it is a key component. Another option teachers today often use is task-based language teaching. I'm not going to define all of the aspects of task-based language teaching today. Um, but I will say that grammar is often addressed, instruction is included, uh, while students are participating in meaning-based communicative tasks. So maybe students are doing a task together, and the uh, a student might have a question about grammar. The teacher might call a timeout and address a grammar point, and then move back into the meaning-based communicative task. So in both of these uh, common approaches today, uh, grammar is taught. And I would say overall, research in the SLA, the second language acquisition community, does support some form of grammar teaching. 
Uh, these experts say it does support acquiring a second language grammar, and it can also speed up the process. So currently, the answer to teach or not to teach is yes. But that leaves us with, with a big question, right? We're supposed to be teaching grammar. <laughs> is there a best way to do it? What do you guys think? Is there one right way? Oh, I see lots of no's there. I agree. <laughs> I wish I could answer that question for you in an easy way, but the research out there today, as well as our experience as teachers in the classroom, uh, lets us know that, no, we can't rely on one single best way to teach grammar. A big reason for this is that the process of acquiring a second language is difficult to monitor. It's hidden. Why do you think it's hidden? We can't watch second language acquisition happening. I see Hoda says it's implicit. It's happening inside the brain, right? We can't see directly into our student's mind to see that moment of when uh, a structure or a target form is actually acquired and assimilated into a, a language system. Um, and the process of acquiring grammar is also very individualized. There might be trends in terms of patterns for how languages are learned, but when acquisition happens is um, unique to each person out there. So it can be tricky to say, oh, there is one best way because we can't watch the um, types of action that trigger acquisition, right? So where does that leave us teachers? Hmm, we know we're supposed to be teaching grammar, but what tips do we have about how to do that? Here's a quote from Rod Ellis, who wrote one of your pre-webinar reading articles. Um, here he says, learning grammar, a second language grammar, is a complex process and almost certainly can be assisted best by a variety of approaches. But what is important is to recognize what options are available and what the theoretical rationales for these options are. So the second part of this quote, the first part focuses on variety is the way to go, right? And I see Carmen saying eclectic, yes, bringing in lots of different approaches. Um, but Ellis also points out that our job as teachers is to recognize what tools are available to us and why we might want to use them, not just use things blindly, to apply tools in a well-reasoned way. A very simple way of interpreting Ellis's quote would be to say that variety is the spice of life and grammar teaching. Uh, for those of you who might have attended uh, our, my colleagues Curtis and Kevin's webinar earlier, they focused on spicing up the present perfect uh, with a lot of options. I hope you have a chance to review that uh, on the Ning if you didn't get to see it, but um, it's a principle that I truly believe in. Grammar is much more interesting when we bring in a variety of techniques. So to help us with that, actually, let's, let's pause for a moment. Um, think about your own teaching style. Do you tend to rely on one approach very often? Do you find yourself in a grammar rut? This is just something to sort of keep in the back of your mind as we're exploring options today. Um, it can be very easy to fall into a routine with our grammar teaching. Okay, now let's move on and look at those key concepts related to grammar teaching and second language acquisition. Let's first think about why we teach grammar. Our goal is usually to help students become aware of some quality of the grammar feature that we're looking at, right? We want to draw their attention to the grammar. And we do this for several reasons. We want students to be able to mentally process the grammar feature, to be able to understand it in input. So when they're listening, um, we want to be able to, or maybe a reading as well, and we want them to be able to produce it, whether it's speaking or writing. And we do this all so for the long term that students will be able to acquire or internalize this target language and use it at will whenever they need it for meaningful communication. So grammar is sort of a means to an end, helping our students be able to use the language for meaningful communication. 
Now, when I say we want students to internalize the target form, I'm not just talking about the structure. I'm also talking about meaning and use. So this pyramid, which you might have seen before, or you might have heard called MFU, um, is often associated with Diane Larson Freeman. And it helps us remind, it helps remind teachers that there are many facets or angles to approaching a grammar um, topic. So not just what the form looks like and how to make it, but also what it signifies or means and when it's appropriate to use with which audience. So we're covering here structure, semantics, and pragmatics, sort of all aspects of language use, right? So let's keep that in mind as we move forward. And next I'll address a term that was in our pre-webinar survey, noticing. Uh, that was one that many people weren't familiar with. Basically, as we instruct our students uh, in relation to gra in, on grammar topics, we are helping them notice something unique about the form, right? And the idea is that students will become aware of patterns in how language behaves. And if you notice something, it might jump out at you in your own input as you speak or as you write, uh, or excuse me, as your own output as you speak or as you write, or it might uh, stand out in input if you encounter this form either in listening or writing. So noticing is an aim of grammar instruction that is thought to aid in acquisition. So uh, I see Sergey asks if it means comprehension. I would say it's not uh, directly equivalent to comprehension. It's mostly just having your attention drawn to it to say, ah, I see that there's something special about this form. It might take a while to understand the form. Hopefully this distinction will become clear as we move through some more examples. Another set of terms we're going to address today are types of knowledge. And here I'm not talking about approaches to grammar teaching. I'm talking about the types of information uh, we store in our brains as knowledge. So the first is implicit. And you'll see some synonyms there, procedural, unconscious, acquired. So it's information that we don't have to actively think about to access. The opposite would be explicit knowledge. This is knowledge we can state. It's conscious knowledge, it's declarative, it's learned. So these topics I think are a bit abstract. Let's look at an example with a third person singular S. We have a couple of sentences here. On the left you can see I, you, we, they like coffee. And then the odd man out, right? The third person singular. Tina likes with an S, T. Hmm. So as a native speaker, no one ever told me about this. Do you think anybody gave me a rule as, as I was a young child acquiring my first language saying, hey, pay attention to the third person singular? Definitely not. It was implicit knowledge for me. It wasn't until I became a teacher or also when I studied other languages that I even knew what the third person singular was. Um, and I couldn't explain it until um, I acquired that explicit knowledge. So let's think about the opposite case now for no, uh, non-native speakers. Do you think you first encountered um, information about the third person singular explicitly or implicitly? Raise your hand if you think it might have been explicitly. All right, I see the hands going up. Definitely. Usually when you're learning a language, you're first going to encounter grammar as some sort of, in, in an explicit sort of way, where you can explain that there is a rule. You're consciously aware of some unique feature of the grammar, in this case, the third person singular S. Hopefully, over time, as it looks like as Mohammed said, um, this information will become implicit information you don't need to think about actively to use, right? So our assumption today is that explicit grammar knowledge, knowledge you can state or explain, can over time become more automatic, unconscious, implicit knowledge. And this happens, we believe, through um, experiencing language many times in a variety of ways, 
and in contexts that have meaning for the learners. We want them to be able to use it to meet their communicative needs, right? Okay, let's continue our review here. The next two concepts, which seem like many people are familiar with, are approaches in grammar instruction. On the right, we have, or excuse me, on the left, we have two terms, deductive and inductive, and on the right, we have definitions. Can we match the term to the definition? Uh, definition one states a rule is provided first and examples and practice follow. Definition two says a rule is discovered from the examples provided. Which is inductive and which is deductive? Let's see your thoughts in the chat box. Do we think number one is inductive or deductive? All right, we see some answers coming in. Well, I'm going to agree with Natalia. Number one is deductive. This is how they match up. Another way to think of these terms is moving from big concepts to specifics. So for deductive, we start with a big concept, a rule, maybe a guideline about grammar or language use, and then we move to specific examples. And this could be, um, you know, we could relate this to PPP. So you present in some way a big concept, a big rule, and then the students have active opportunities to explore and practice with specific examples. The opposite approach would be inductive. We start with specific examples and then we try to establish the rule, the guideline, the big concept through discovery types of activities. So now that we've established both of these as options, I will argue that neither approach is superior. Uh, we had a lot of opinions in our pre-webinar discussions on the Ning about preferences and I think everyone um, might have a preference for one or the other. Maybe you like a combination. But I think both inductive and deductive approaches can be very effective. I think it depends on the grammar point you're trying to teach. Sometimes I think it depends on the amount of time you have. It can also be um, sort of your students' preferences and expectations. So both have options um, for use in class. That said, uh, I would anecdotally say that most teachers tend to rely on deductive approaches uh, more than inductive approaches. Can you all think of some reasons why uh, teachers might prefer deductive approaches? Can you share your ideas in the chat box, please? Hmm, I see Sam, uh, Sam Miguel says, short of time, time saving. Okay, that's definitely a reason. Mm, deductive is easier, I see. Ha easier how? Uh, depends on the student level. I could see that. How might it depend on the student level? Well, Roxana makes a great point. Uh, teachers might have been taught deductively themselves, therefore um, it's what they know, it's what they want to try to apply in their own teaching. Um, it doesn't require a lot of preparation. These are definitely great ideas. I think um, you're hitting on a lot of the key reasons that uh, deductive tends to be um, used more often. I would also say sometimes it's a, a teacher control thing. The teachers, this approach tends to be a bit more teacher-centered, and so as you plan, uh, maybe you feel a bit more comfortable uh, actively directing the process. I will, I will say that you can have an equally important role in inductive activities as well. Um, so we will see that in the future. Okay, now that we've done a review of some key terms for grammar that we're going to use today, we are going to begin our focus on a specific technique, consciousness raising tasks. So we're going to do one together to get started. Are you ready? Okay, so what I'd like you all to do is pretend to be my students. And today you are university students, so pretty advanced level-wise, and you're in an English for academic purposes setting. Our lesson today focuses on academic voice, which is something we've covered in a very <laughs> earlier webinar, very much uh, 
quite a while ago. This is the, the tone of academic writing and the level of formality. So that's what we're looking at today. And let's pretend that we just did a review of some rules where uh, I, the teacher, uh, laid out some guidelines, some general rules about grammar and formality, and then we discussed them. So uh, a deductive approach. What happens next is I pass around half sheets of paper, and these pieces of paper are going to have two pairs of, or excuse me, four pairs of sentences uh, on them. And since I can't give you a piece of paper at the moment, we're going to use the poll feature to replicate this idea. So if we can open the poll, please. So here is your half sheet of paper. You have four pairs of sentences. What I'd like you to do is compare each item in the pair and tell me which is less formal as you read it. I'm going to be quiet for about 30 seconds and let you read in peace. But remember, in each pair, you're looking for the less formal option. All right, about 10 more seconds. Okay, let's check our answers as a group. It looks like there's a lot of agreement. So for the first item, we have the program was set up to improve maternal health in developing countries versus the program was established to improve maternal health. It seems like almost everyone agrees the first option is less formal. For the second item, we have researchers found out that adult second language acquisition processes follows predictable stages. The second sentence saying determined that. Most people seem to agree that the first item was less formal. And the third option, people thought uh, the second option, America's economic growth rate has been going up and down, was less formal than America's economic growth rate has been fluctuating. And in the last one, most people seem to think that the first option was less formal. The aim of pronunciation instruction is not to completely get rid of a learner's accent versus the aim of pronunciation instruction is to not completely eliminate the learner's accent. All right, so we've checked our answers as a group and identified the less formal option. Let's go back to the presentation, please. So now let's pretend I'm passing out a new half sheet of paper. And this half piece of paper says, examine the same pairs of words and work with a partner, although we're going to all work together, <laughs> to figure out what you notice about the underlined words. So in the chat box, let's spend about a minute discussing what we notice about the underlined words in each pair. I see some people picking up on phrasal verbs. What about those phrasal verbs? Hmm. Uh, synonyms, yep, the underlined words are definitely synonyms. All right, and many of you are already moving on to the next part of this activity where I would ask you, again in pairs, but to get, we're going to do it in the chat box, can you develop a general rule or guideline based on the information that you've observed? And I see many of you are right on track. I see uh, Radian Yemen says phrasal verbs are more informal. Um, yep, Tatiana says phrasal verbs are less formal. So, exactly. The rule might look something like this. In academic writing, multi-word verbs, also known as phrasal verbs, can often seem more informal than single-word verbs. So you guys were right on. Okay, so let's come out of our pretend mode for a second. I will give you some extra information about the classroom. So as I said, before doing this task, 
we had worked on some deductive whole class discussion about rules related to formality and grammar. Then we moved into the um, consciousness raising task. And during this task, we had a bunch of different interaction patterns. So we went for initially the individual identification of which one is less formal. We checked our answers as a whole class. Then we moved to small group work where students were examining the verbs and developing a rule. And then we came back together, which is what we're doing now, and discussed our findings and the implications. So in that discussion after the task, I would let my students know that this is just a guideline. It's not a 100% of the time rule. You will see phrasal verbs in academic writing, um, but the overuse of phrasal verbs can give your writing an informal tone. I also let my students know that they might see feedback comments from me on their graded work. There might be a note that says verb formality, and they might see that, wow, these are all attached to phrasal verbs. Hmm. So this is some uh, information to prepare them for my feedback. And I would also suggest that they add it to a self-editing checklist. Um, a self-editing checklist, at least in my classes, have a list of standard items that students should check their own work for before they turn it in or before they share it for peer review. Um, and then students should also add special items that might be a problem for them personally to their self-editing checklist. So um, I would make the suggestion that students add this item to their self-editing checklist. And in terms of total time to do this activity in my real classroom, it usually takes about 10 minutes. It's pretty quick. So let's work together to review some of the qualities of this task. Um, my first question for you is, was this activity deductive or inductive? I see Hoda says inductive. Yep, this one was inductive, right? We went from examples to developing a rule. So we went from small to big, inductive. Question number two. Did we develop implicit or explicit knowledge with this activity? Hmm, I'm seeing a mix, mixed answers here. Did we come up worse? Can students talk about what they know, or is this automatic um, unconscious knowledge? In this case, we asked them to explicitly state the rule, and it was explicit knowledge. And did we pick out one language feature to highlight in this activity? Miriam says yes. And I see uh, Silvana says verbs. Exactly. We talked about verbs and formality. So in terms of the aspect of the language, we were talking about use, right? Formality. Did you, while you were doing this activity, get some examples of that included the target language? You sure did. You got four pairs of sentences. All right. Did you have to use your brain power to analyze those examples? Yep. My presentation is kind of frozen there. Yep. You had to do some compare and contrast and also some analysis. Were you asked to develop a rule? Yep. Hmm. Here's an important question. During the course of this activity, did you have to produce or use the target language? I see some no's. That is correct. That will become very important here in a moment. And having done this activity, do you think you might notice that sometimes phrasal verbs seem a little more informal when you encounter them in the future? Does this help you notice some quality of the target language? I hope so. <laughs> OK, so together we have uh, completed a, a consciousness raising task, and we've described it. Let's compare it to the definition that Ellis gives in the article that is on the name in the pre-webinar readings. According to Ellis, consciousness raising activities are usually inductive. They develop explicit knowledge, as we saw. And during the task, as we also observed, Performing or using the target language isn't the main goal, but learning about the target language is. 
So we want to become more aware of some quality of the grammar point. And Ellis lists several other characteristics. He says the target language feature is isolated, so it is separated out in some way, that learners receive examples that are going to illustrate a characteristic of the target language, and that the learners need to use their brains. They need to use intellectual effort to understand the feature. Um, and if there are some issues um, of understanding, then the teacher is there to provide clarification through either more examples, through some description, or some direct explanation. So the teacher is still actively involved throughout this process. And it's optional, but in the course of a consciousness raising activity, learners might develop a role to describe the feature. All right, so again, if you want to know more in depth here about how Ellis defines it, please check out the article on the name. All right, so some point that can be confusing is the, that in this age of communicative language teaching, within a consciousness raising task, immediately using the target language isn't the main focus, right? It's learning about the target language. Even though that's the case, that doesn't mean we should only use consciousness raising activities. We can use them um, in combination with other techniques. And it also doesn't mean that it is um, prohibiting communication, right? Did we see a variety of interaction patterns during our communicative tasks that we did together? We saw individual work. We saw group work. We saw whole class work, right? So we, students had a chance to work with each other to solve a problem. And I would also argue that um, consciousness raising activities go hand in hand with communicative practice. So you can use them as a warm up to get your students' brains active and focused at the beginning of a class. You can use it during presentation or to change pace in a lesson. And this is what I did in my lesson, right? I used it to present a role and also to change the pace because we had been working on deductive tasks before that. You can use it to review a previously um, encountered concept. And you can use it alongside implicit practice. So what does this mean? Uh, I'm going to refer again to the webinar with uh, Curtis and Kevin, where they talked about using games, uh, such as Would You Rather and a few other, to um, let students practice the grammar without a lot of focus on the rules, to use it freely and personally. Well, perhaps you want to play a game with your students um, that involves some target language, and then you want to draw their attention to it explicitly with a consciousness raising task. There's no reason you can't do those two things together. And I see somebody asking for more examples. Don't worry, we're going to do more examples together. Uh, I will say that metalinguistic, all right, that's a term I asked about at the beginning of the webinar, metalanguage, metalinguistic, that just refers to the language we use to talk about language. <laughs> that sounds confusing, right? If I say adverb, conditional, present perfect, um, those grammar terms are meta-language, the, the language we use to talk about language. So students don't need to know all of the grammar terminology, the meta-language, uh, but it can help. So for example, um, in the activity we just did, if students didn't know the word, the metalinguistic term, phrasal verb, they could say multi-word verb or more than one word verb. The important thing is that they get the concept. I'm not always as focused on the grammar terminology, but knowing grammar terminology can help. Uh, I will also say that consciousness raising tasks are often most effective with higher level learners, so intermediate and above. They can be done with beginner level learners, uh, usually beginner adults, but it requires a lot more um, direct hands-on guidance from the teacher. So there are some things to think about uh, before we move into some more examples. And before we move on, uh, I wanted to show you a picture. These are actually my students doing the activity that we just did together. And you can see there they are working in teams, actively communicating to solve a problem. So just because the focus is on um, how to uh, comprehend a concept, it doesn't mean that the students aren't talking to each other. And I thought this quote from uh, Dave and Jane Willis's 
uh, book chapter, which is also on the name, was a very nice way to sum up about consciousness raising tasks. They can be seen as guided problem solving, in which learners are encouraged to notice particular features, to draw conclusions from what they notice, and then to organize their view of the language. Okay, before we move on to two more examples together, let's think about benefits now that we know a bit more about the, the definition and qualities of consciousness raising tasks. Um, I've given you one idea to start with. What might be some other benefits of consciousness raising tasks? Um, I said that they do promote noticing and help students become more aware of target language and input and output. What else? Let's see, Iman says they create situations for communication. Uh, Hoda points out an increased motivation, definitely. That's an awesome idea. Uh, let's see, Jules says uh, learner-centered and student-based, says Meredith, similar ideas, definitely. Uh, Adriano points out the cooperative work among the students. Uh, San Miguel hit on one of my favorite ones, thinking and promoting self-discovery. And students are aware of how they learn. It helps them figure out how they like to learn. That's a great point. Thank you for sharing that one. Jose hit on another one of my favorites, student confidence. It makes them feel in charge of their learning, like they can solve a problem, right? Metacognition, I see, motivation, and um, critical thinking was one I saw earlier. You guys are right on target. Great answers. Um, you covered many of the items I have here. Um, so self-awareness, cooperative learning, appeals to people with different learning styles. In this case, usually analytical learners really like the, the problem-solving piece. And people also um, look at solving a puzzle as a challenge, which can be motivating and interesting, right? Uh, encouraging critical thinking. I think we've already seen, um, just in our short task we did together, we used uh, compare and contrast and uh, other types of analysis. And it can encourage students to take charge of their own learning. Again, a student-centered approach and um, adding that variety, changing the pace. Um, I will say, just like any other grammar teaching technique, consciousness raising tasks have some disadvantages. Um, two that come to my mind right away are, uh, they are a little more time consuming to plan. Anytime you're going to turn things over to students, um, you have to think about how you want to do it and why and sort of help be ready to guide them through the process. The other piece is that um, some students might resist consciousness raising tasks. Why might that be? Um, perhaps they have a different learning preference. They're not analytical learners. They like to go from um, rules to application. They prefer deductive approaches. And maybe some people, um, students, maybe they think that deductive is really the right way to teach grammar. So they might resist some experimentation with inductive tasks. So just to say, Benefits, drawbacks, consciousness raising tasks are just like any other technique. Oh, and I see um, Sandra says don't like working in groups. Yeah, some students prefer to learn individually. So um, I think there are ways to structure our grammar teaching that take these things into account, right? Okay, what you asked for, more examples. We're going to do two more. The first one is going to deal with foreign sense. Always a tricky thing to teach, in my opinion. In our example today, um, going to, uh, the student group is adults with intermediate level proficiency. And this class has been working on topics related to the workplace. So today's theme is work experience. One of the many objectives for this lesson was that students will be able to use either in speaking or writing the present perfect with foreign sense to describe events that began in the past and continue up until now. So for example, I worked at the hospital for three years. A sub-objective is to distinguish when to use for and sense. And as you can see here, amount of time versus point in time. We're gonna to try to help students get to that distinction um, with some guidance from the teacher. So where does the consciousness raising task fit into the overall lesson? The flow for this lesson was we started with a homework review. 
we went into the consciousness raising task to really pinpoint our, our minds on foreign sense. That was small group activity. Then we moved to a whole class deductive presentation on the present perfect. Then the students developed a list of their work experience individually. And then students got into pairs and interviewed each other about their work list. Again, hoping to draw out the target language um, that's the focus of this lesson. And this is all building towards a big communicative activity where students and groups were going to um, be bosses. They were going to review job ads and applications and then pick whoever was going to receive the job based on their experience and they were going to have to explain why. So as you can see, this consciousness raising task is one small piece of a larger sequence that involves communicative use-based activities. Okay, so the consciousness raising task itself. This might look familiar to those of you who read Ellis's article. This is an adaptation of the activity that was in the reading on the name. Um, at the top, you can see several people who work at Bob's Family Restaurant, what position they have, when they join the restaurant, and for how long that they have been working at the restaurant. So the first thing that students are asked to do, and again, they're working in groups this time, is to read the sentences about the employees and just notice, just pay attention to when for and since are used. And you can see that those words are in italics to even help with the noticing more, really drawing attention to the distinction. At this point, the students aren't asked to do anything with the knowledge. They're just asked to start thinking about this, right? OK. Um, and I see somebody say, why not ask students to provide their own examples? Hmm, we might get to that in just a moment. <laughs> so we're helping uh, build along the way with some scaffolding, leading them down the path of, of um, awareness that we would like them to achieve. So in the second part, this is called a grammar judgment task. Um, they are asked to pick which sentences are not allowed in English. They are looking for ungrammatical items and to think about why. So they would look at the four options here. Which ones do you think are ungrammatical? I see A and B, definitely. So we would mark an X next to those items. Um, and at this point, I, you might say, well, why do you want the learners to look for the one that's wrong? Hmm, that's confusing. We might do this because we want to encourage learners to monitor their own output. Maybe they're editing their own writing reviewing their own work. Um, this gets you, them into the, the habit of sort of checking their understanding the language against the output that they see, right? So we would move on to part three then. This is the continuation of the same sheet. You can see we have our incorrect options marked in part two. So moving on to part three, we ask our groups of students to look at the information that they have. So they've got the chart at the top, part one and part two and try to make up a generalization, just like we did in our task earlier about when, for, and since are used, right? So we have for with an amount of time and since with a point in time. The next point would be part four. And this is when students are going to get a little chance to experiment with the language uh, in a personal way. So write two sentences about how long you've worked in your current job, or if you're not working, perhaps, how long you've lived in your home. Use for and since. So um, the groups would develop two sentences, at least, that contrast the usages of for and since. And again, this is not the end of the lesson. This is just getting them ready, getting them primed for activities that are going to happen later in the lesson. I will say that sometimes the, the rule development part, if you choose to include that in your consciousness raising task, can be difficult, yeah? So the teacher can provide some extra support or extra uh, scaffolding. And I see Fanny saying, yes, she thinks number three could be a challenge. Um, in this case, I had upper intermediate students. But if I had lower intermediate students, I might provide ma matching, like you see here, where students can um, build the rule from some pre-provided information. Uh, fill in the blank is another option, right? So to summarize, with this short activity, this, this activity in class would probably take about mm, 
20-ish minutes, depending again on the individual students. Um, we started this lesson with an inductive task, the consciousness raising task, and we moved to deductive. So why do you think we did that? Again, variety, right? Change of pace. We got our students ready to notice the language they're going to use in communicative activities later on. And we asked them to use their brains. We asked them to do some analysis, to build a hypothesis, and do a comparison. OK, here's another example for you. Um, I love teaching comparative adjectives. So many different ways you can do it. Here is uh, one way you can maybe add to your existing tools for teaching comparative adjectives. So this is a different audience. Um, I have used this uh, specifically with teens. And again, intermediate learners. And if any of you all teach younger people, you probably know that they are crazy for gadgets, uh, all kinds of electronics. So that's the theme of, of this class. We were talking about shopping for electronics and how to get a good deal. Does that seem like a realistic skill one might need in life? How to, to analyze something when shopping and try to get the best possible deal? I think that's something that we all do, right? I think this could be considered an authentic need um, for most people for communication. Uh, one of the specific objectives for this lesson was for the students to recognize and produce comparative adjectives and I want them to be able to discover some general rules for how to form them. So when to use adjective plus ER and when to use more plus adjective. So taller versus more efficient, for example. So as we discussed earlier, there are many ways this could happen in class. The teacher could start out and explain the rule and then the students would have the chance to apply them. Would that be deductive or inductive? Quick quiz. If we weren't exactly, Mohammed, that would be deductive. So here's an alternative. This one would be going from examples to try to get to the rule. Let's look at this together. Um, I will say in terms of the lesson flow, the way I started out this class was to get students focused on comparatives. We did this as a situational presentation, the whole class together, and I had two pictures. One was of a smartphone, maybe like an iPhone or an Android phone. And the other was a feature phone, like a Nokia phone. And I asked them to tell me about these two different phones, to describe them. And so maybe the student would say, uh, the smartphone is cool. And I would write, the smartphone is cooler than the feature phone. Maybe another student would pipe in and say, oh, but the feature phone is, is uh, cheap. And I said, so I write, the feature phone is cheaper than the smartphone. So just collecting lots of examples of student-generated language up on the board. At this point, I'm not actually doing and telling them what to do with it. This isn't grammar explanation at this point. So I'm just asking them, you know, hey, give me some, give me some language to work with here and trying to get their attention focused on adjectives and comparatives. And without any further explanation of any rules, I see some questions going on. This piece is Initially, the situational presentation isn't really deductive or inductive because I'm not explaining grammar. I'm just collecting examples of language on the board. I'm not trying to, to get anybody focused on um, any specific rules at this point. So then we do jump into the authentic, or excuse me, the inductive uh, task, consciousness raising task in pairs. Students are going to work out the rules for forming comparatives. And then we're going to move out from pair work to group work and do a communicative task where students are going to look at real advertisements for electronics, maybe something you'd get with a newspaper. And then they have a certain amount of money to spend and they have to decide what they're going to buy and why and explain it to the class. So this should elicit the target language from the lesson, right? Comparative adjectives. So let's take a closer look at the inductive consciousness raising task. OK, so here we have a worksheet. You could do this on the board as well. Students are given two sets of advertisements. The top information is for uh, TVs. The bottom information is 
vacuum cleaners. I realize vacuum cleaners might not be overly exciting to teenagers, but hey, it's something that they would see in the newspaper. Um, so they're asked to examine the advertisements and then read the sentences below. So the sentences below all feature comparative adjectives so that at the top the visa is brighter than the Polara, the visa is clearer than the Polara. This is all information drawn from the advertisements. Um, so what students are asked to do is to take the comparative adjective in bold and then write the base form. And this is a term my students were familiar with. We talked about the base form a lot. So this is not a new concept for them. So write the base form for each comparative adjective. So they end up with a list that looks like this. We have bright, clear, fancy, large, modern, expensive, um, all words that might be used to describe electronics down at the bottom, cheap, small, long, heavy, useful, powerful. So they have a list of comparatives and base forms. Now they're going to do some work with this information. So on the second page, they are asked to do some categorization, some sorting. And in my classes, I am uh, very big into using, uh, having my students understand the concepts of syllables, usually for pronunciation purposes. We do a lot of clap it out for getting syllables, tap it out on the desk, um, kinesthetic ways of looking at syllables. So my students are used to that. So I ask them to organize their list that you can see on the right side and to put them in the column. We're looking at section B here. So to put all the one syllable base words together, all the two syllable base words together, all the three syllable base words together. So we have clear, clear, that goes in one. We have fancy, got two, right? We've got large, one, modern, two, expensive, three. So my students can sort through the syllable piece very quickly, and they're going to end up with something that looks like this. Straight forward so far, right? Then they need to write the comparative form next to each word. So, so it'll look like this. Students can either try to do this from their understanding of comparative adjectives. If they get stuck, they can go back to the first page, right? This isn't new information. This is the exact same information available to them on the first page. So now we have a chart that sorts us by uh, syllable one, two, and three. Now they're going to use the chart to do some more investigation. So part C asks them to go do another grammar judgment task. Again, we're looking for the incorrect forms, and they're going to mark which ones are incorrect. Take a minute and look at these sentences and see if we see any that are incorrect. I'll help you out here for time's sake. Are moderner more happy? Sometimes people use more happy, but prescriptively it's incorrect and efficienter, Ooh, I can't even say it. So our groups of students would mark those as being incorrect. And again, we're trying to train them to um, look at language analytically, try to find uh, faults with the pattern. Okay, and then the last part is, let's see if you can take all of the information you've put together so far and develop a rule for making and using comparative adjectives. In this case, um, I used a more supportive technique for the rule formation. I provided most of the rule and just add the, asked them to it put in the most important piece of information. So for the first rule, for one syllable, adjectives like clear, add the ending, what to the word, if we look at our chart. Exactly, Rady. We're going to add ER, and if the word ends in E, we're just going to add R, little spelling tip for the students there. For two-syllable words that end in Y, like happy, so if we look at our chart at the top, we've got fancy, we've got heavy, that becomes fancier and heavier, all right? So, yep, you guys have got it, add I-E-R. For adjectives with two or more syllables, other ones, and uh, we want to add the word, let's look at our chart, let's go right to our three-syllable words. We've got more powerful, more expensive, right? Awesome. So we let the, the students get to these conclusions by themselves by looking at lots of examples. And then just as a reminder, um, a, re a review for the students in this case, 
we're going to use the word than after the adjective when comparing two things. Pacific cell phone reception in excuse me, Pacific cell phone reception is clearer than Xtel reception. So as I said, you could have presented these rules to the students up front, had them practice them in a variety of ways, communicative or less communicative. Um, this is just one other option. Um, in this case, we had students working together. We had students using classification and comparison critical thinking skills. And we got them ready for the communicative activity that followed. Here is something um, very important I will point out. Do you think that after doing these two pages of worksheets that the students are going to be able to produce the form correctly right away? Do you think that they're going to... Hmm, I might agree with uh, Aureli on this one. Some of them. I would say that most students, in all honesty, are not going to be able to correctly produce the forms 100% of the time right away. And that's okay. That's totally fine. Um, immediate language acquisition of these concepts after a consciousness raising task, I don't expect that. But what we do achieve is we make them more aware. We help them notice the form, realize there's something special about this form, and we get them thinking. And they also have something that they can reference as they go along and get ready to do the communicative activity or as they write. So um, immediate correct production is not expected from a consciousness raising task. I like the way moderator Jenny says it. This helps students become language detectives so they'll start looking for rules on their own. I think that's very important. Again, helping students get in the habit of looking for patterns when they're encountering new language. Alrighty, so we've looked at a couple of examples together. We've defined consciousness raising tasks. How about if you want to make one for your own class? So what we have here is a checklist of things to consider. Um, I see Sharon has a quick question. I'll actually pause here. Uh, what if the students aren't able to detect the rules? What do you guys think? What would you do if the students were not able to detect the rules? What's the role of the teacher in all of this? That's a great answer, Hoda. I see Meredith says she'd scaffold it. Exactly. Um, something I haven't mentioned yet is the role of the teacher. Um, we're not just handing them worksheets or putting something up on the board and turning our students loose and putting them out on their own. We're there acting as guides throughout the process. So there might be times when the teacher needs to step in and stop all of the groups working and go, hey, I notice a lot of people are having problems with whatever, and then take time to address it as a group. So the teacher is still acting as a facilitator, acting as a guide. I see people saying monitoring. Yes, you're actively participating in the consciousness raising tasks. So um, if the students aren't getting to the rule, that's fine. Help them. That's what they're, we're there for. Thanks for that question. That was very helpful. All right, so creating one of these tasks. First step is picking the target language. What are we going to feature in our task? You might pick first conditional or something, um, really any, any type of grammar topic. Now you're going to decide what aspect you want to highlight, what feature of the target language. And if we think back to the beginning of the webinar, what features are there to uh, grammar? Is it just the form? Right, Mohammed, we could focus on usage. Exactly. Uh, okay, it's form, meaning, and use. So pick which ones. Maybe you want to focus on all of them. Maybe you want to focus on just one special aspect. Um, just as we did in that formality example, we only really focused on use in that one. So it's up to you to decide what your students need. The next is uh, selecting a text or a situation. You're going to have to provide them examples, right? Uh, a question to ask yourself is, can you use something authentic? So in the comparative adjectives example, we were going to have some real advertisements. Um, in the 
example with uh, formality, I picked sentences from the students' textbooks. Um, so try to use an authentic text if possible. Um, text can be a, a variety of lengths. It doesn't have to just be short pieces of language. Many of the examples we looked at today had shorter stretches of language. You could use an entire song, an entire reading passage, um, and do something with it to highlight that target language. So you're not limited to short amounts of data. Um, the next big decision is trying to figure out what you want the students to do. How can they use these examples to better understand what you're trying to highlight? So let's look at some options together. We had an article on the name from uh, Willis and Willis, Dave and Jane, um, and they provide a list of different types of options. This isn't exhaustive. They have more in their article, so please do go and look it, um, look it up on the name. Let's do a little matching here. On the left-hand side, we have different types of tasks or operations we can ask the students do, to do to help them understand the language better. We have some definitions on the side. So let's see if we can get these matched up. So identify. Which of these definitions looks like it's asking the students to identify? Seeing a few answers right now, the majority is six. Yes, that's correct. In identification tasks, the students are looking at the examples trying to find or see a pattern. So we did that today. We did some identification tasks today. How about classify, the second one there? Which description matches classifying? I'm seeing lots of threes and ones, the people that are saying threes, you are correct. This is sorting according to similarities and differences. Um, we did a little bit of classifying with our syllable counting part, right? We sorted the information according to similarities and differences by number of syllables. All right, next we have hypothesis building and checking. Which one matches up there? Exactly, number five. We're asking either students to make a generalization and then explore some examples, or here's another way you could do this. You could give students a hypothesis, an educated statement, or a general statement about language, and ask them to see if it's true or false. That's another way to, um, instead of asking them to come up with a rule, you give them a rule and ask them to find out, hey, is this really how it works by looking at examples? Uh, next, we have cross-language exploration. Many of you are already throwing uh, one up there. That's correct. Um, this works really well if all of your students speak the same or share a first language um, and can be very helpful when English has a feature that doesn't exist in the first language or vice versa. Um, or sometimes uh, one concept in the first language or in English is covered by two concepts in another language. So um, I'm not suggesting direct grammar translation or anything like this, but if you happen to have students that all share a language, um, this kind of cross-language exploration can be very helpful. How about recall? I see several fours in there. Yep, we're asking students to remember and reconstruct parts to, to bring um, them to, uh, to help them notice. And finally, reference training, that leaves us with Number two, I love these types of activities because, again, we're building not just language, well, they are language skills, but also life skills. Teaching students to use dictionaries, grammars, and study guides while they attempt to solve puzzles about grammar. That sounds like something they need to do in real life, right? So if you're going back to refer to this presentation later, I put them there in order for you, and they are there clearly explained again in the Dave and Jane Willis article available on the name. So many more options are available, but these are some very common ones. So let's go back to our checklist. So we're deciding how the students are going to manipulate the data. So we just looked at options. The other thing we need to think about is our role, right? The teacher role. How are we going to support our students during this process? We might need to provide um, some support in materials we provide, and we definitely want to be ready to support them during the task um, as monitors, guides, facilitators. 
Uh, you can also decide if you want students to state a rule as part of your task. And then decide how the task will relate to other parts of your lesson. Maybe if you're using it as a warm-up uh, for review, it doesn't need to link to what happens next because you're using it again to recycle and review. Um, but usually you're going to tie in your consciousness raising task to some other communicative activity, right? And you might also want to think about assessment. Since we can't see language acquisition and some of the mental processes happening, assessment um, for consciousness raising tasks is usually informal and it's based on completion. Were the students either individually, groups, pairs, able to complete the task, yes or no? All right. Well, thank you guys for keeping such great attention and sharing your wonderful thoughts throughout the webinar today. I want to summarize what we've covered. I think we all agree that there is not one superior ultimate way to teach grammar and that we can best serve our students by bringing a variety of teaching techniques, inductive and deductive, that will appeal to different learner styles and can also effectively address a variety of grammar points. Uh, one approach we looked at today was consciousness raising tasks, and I hope this is one more tool that you'll be ready to try out in your own classrooms. Again, it is in it's inductive, developing that explicit, statable, aware knowledge. We're helping students be language detectives, as moderator Jenny said, um, by examining language and drawing some conclusions about how it works all with the aim of helping students notice something about the grammar feature. I'll leave you today with one last quote here that I really like. This is from Prevost and Lucchini, also available on the name. Um, and it says, teachers not only want learners to achieve the self-discovery of grammar rules, encouraged by consciousness raising tasks, but also the self-expression of them in communication. This quote helps me remember that we're not just trying to fill our students' brains with grammar rules, right? We're trying to give them that, that creative ability to combine what they know about grammar, vocabulary, and other language aspects to meet their personal communication needs, right? This is all for their long-term communication needs in the end. So thank you guys so, so much. And I look forward to talking to you on the Ning. Uh, I'll be on chat for a little while after this. And I will also be available through the discussion board. So get out there, spice up your grammar teaching with a little variety. And um, I hope to see you again in the future. Thank you. <laughs>